Um, I'm going to be opening the day today um, with some musings that are partly based around a paper that was written by myself, Maurice Lipsedge, Brown and Paul Crawford, who can't be with us today. Um, and it sparked off some questions that made me think were particularly related to the theme of today, which is about mental states in fiction. Um, we're very honoured to have Patricia Dunker here, who'll be speaking at 11 o'clock, um, just after I've finished. And uh, Dr. Maurice Lipsedge will be speaking this afternoon on the representation of psychiatrists in fiction. So I'm going to, uh, to open the day by trying to negotiate quotes on PowerPoint and a paper speech, uh, which may go horribly wrong, so I'll apologise in advance if it does. And as we're a very, very mixed group um, of clinicians, literary academics, writers, um, and even some anthropology staff, it may well be that I overcomplicate or undercomplicate the uh, arguments around borderline personality disorder, literature reading, and empathy. So to spark off the day with something that I hope won't seem totally irrelevant, among mental health diagnoses, the phrase borderline personality disorder, or merely a borderline, is arguably the most derogatory. The mere existence in the UK of policy documents such as personality disorder, no longer a diagnosis of exclusion, paradoxically ex acknowledges the exclusion of individuals who suffer from this diagnosis. The reason I wanted to talk about borderline personality disorder is it's something that frequently occurs in fiction, but is very rarely named as such in novels. And it's a form of madness that, um, in many respects, is defined as being not a madness and not treatable and not an illness, but paradoxically is one of the most common presentations to mental health teams. It's also well documented that clinical attitudes towards people with personality disorders can be extremely negative, and you should all have a reference list that relates to what I'm talking about here. Uh, Winston, in 2000, suggests that individuals with borderline personality disorder frequently present in crisis but are often difficult to engage in any form of treatment. Their behaviour causes considerable anxiety, but their ambivalence about treatment often leaves professionals feeling frustrated and resentful. These feelings can all too easily be transformed into therapeutic nihilism. Now, the importance of the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder for my argument here is this is a diagnosis that's often deployed by clinicians seeking to understand individuals who may have harmed themselves. Once applied, often limiting pessimistic assumptions can be activated, and in particular, that individuals who self-harm by proxy have a personality disorder and thus are untreatable or at best very difficult to treat. I will get to the relationship with fiction, I promise. The clinical sphere is beginning to develop some insight into how the borderline personality disorder label is deployed in terms of objectifying and distancing clinicians from individuals. For example, in the Oxford Handbook of Psychiatry, Semple et al. suggests that saying someone has borderline traits gives a gloss of understanding to the simple fact that a person repeatedly self-harms without actually communicating any new information except perhaps the therapeutic despair of the psychiatrist. And this notion of communication of information is quite crucial to what I'm going to try and get across today about literature and borderline personality. The importance of literary explanations of deliberate self-harm and related diagnoses is that they offer alternative explanations and rationales to the sometimes overly simplistic process of formulating self-injury as a symptom of an underlying disorder. If the treatment of people who self-harm or who have a diagnosis of personality disorder is to be humanised as policymakers advocate, then it's vital that clinicians have new ways of thinking about the kind of distress that manifests in these behaviours and develop novel approaches in order to offer support to clients. In storytelling and the way we tell our own stories and the way that stories are told in books, we can begin to put ourselves in other people's shoes. 
we can counteract the alienating effects of deliberate self-harm and challenge the aminosity of clinicians who may be intolerant of the expressive or communicative use of the body. Furthermore, parallels can be drawn between the act of reading and the role of the psychiatric clinician. Both entail, to my mind, a degree of creative absorption, interpretation and reformulation. And this notion of parallels between doctor and author, character and patient may be something that we'd like to discuss this afternoon. Now, the two texts that I want to examine here um, are Kristen Waterfield Dewersberg's The Good Patient and Susanna Kaysen's Girl Interrupted, which many people may be more familiar with as a film. Both explore the US mental health system, and that's why I'm using the DSM criteria, because that's the American criteria for borderline personality disorder. Now, Susanna Kaysen's autobiographical narrative is set in the 1960s era of asylum, and Kristen Waterfield Dewersberg in the early 21st century. Kaysen's narrative is her account of her hospitalisation at the age of 18 in a psychiatric unit for a lengthy period of time where she was diagnosed with a borderline personality disorder. Kristen Waterfield Dewersberg's novel, which I highly recommend, concerns a much damaged individual by the name of Darian and her struggle to maintain a successful life in the context of trauma blocked from memory but made manifest through a variety of incomprehensible behaviours. And these incomprehensible behaviours are incomprehensible even to Darian. She can't explain them. While Kaysen's text names borderline personality disorder as her diagnosis, which we may expect in an autobiography, an official label is never given to Darian. And in fact, as we'll see, Darian's therapist comes psychiatrists, psychiatrists explicitly, though not unproblematically, states that she doesn't believe in the argument of personality. So how are we to read these novels? What issues of authenticity in the representations of mental states are raised through the reading of novels? And indeed, given the highly individual experience of madness and extremes of emotions, can an argument be proposed around authenticity? Are all our stories not authentic because they are our stories? And what of notions of clinical accuracy in novels? Is this important, or does this deny the artistic function of fiction and, and literature? So firstly, I want to engage in a very simplistic, but hopefully useful, game of <coughs> symptom spotting, a clinical diagnostics of Kaysen and Darian. Just for the, the non-clinicians in the room, Borderline personality disorder is summarised according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual as a pervasive pattern of instability of interpersonal relationships, self-image and effects, and marked impulsivity beginning in early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts. Individuals must meet at least five of these nine criteria in order to be clinically diagnosed with borderline personality disorder according to the DSM, although in reality, um, provided people meet number five, they generally attract that diagnosis. So the nine uh, elements of borderline personality disorder are frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment, a pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships, markedly and persistently unstable self-image or sense of self, impulsivity in at least two areas that are potentially self-damaging, recurrent suicidal behaviour, gestures or threats or self-mutilating behaviour, effective instability, which I seem to be experiencing at the minute, <laughs> chronic feelings of emptiness, inappropriate intense anger or difficulty controlling anger, and transient stress-related paranoid ideation, again quite features highly when you're giving a talk, or severe dissociative symptoms. Now, Darian, who I'm aware that very few of you will have heard of because I didn't actually inform anyone I was going to be talking about this novel, uh, meets several of these criteria. She struggles to find an identity outside um, a pattern of adopted psychiatric disorders, and she states in the novel, I just try them on for size, quite flippantly. She frequently drinks alcohol to damaging and unsafe excesses, 
engages in a variety of acts of self-harm, and appears to have no baseline normal mood, although I'm not really sure what we mean by a baseline normal mood. She states in the novel, My emotional surfaces have all been blunted, like there's some huge disconnect between events and their implications. Furthermore, she has frequent incomprehensible outbursts of anger throughout the novel and experiences severe and prolonged dissociation. And this is the way she explains this. This is uh, her words in the novel. I'm just not normal. Again, I'm not sure how we define that normal. I don't respond to the world in a normal way. In fact, I hate the word normal. I'm not entirely sure what we mean by that at all. Where anyone else would drink three beers and turn into a giggling fool, I see it as an opportunity to pick a fight with the biggest guy in the room. I never cry. I don't like to feel good. I don't think I've ever had a spontaneous, genuine emotion in my entire life. Those are her words to her therapist. Kaysen, on the other hand, is younger. She's aged 18 at the time of her admission. Um, bearing in mind we're 40, nearly 50 years on from when Kaysen was admitted, I like to think that it's unlikely at 18 she would have received a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder now, although I can't be sure on that. Of particular note, Kaysen struggles with her self-image and continues to do so into adulthood. She engages in self-harm in the form of wrist banging, face scratching and on one occasion overdose and experiences intense anger, fluctuating moods and chronic feelings of emptiness. And in her words, emptiness and boredom, what an understatement. What I felt was complete desolation. So therefore, we can see that both the character of Darian and the author of Kaysen, to a greater or lesser degree, technically meet the criteria for borderline personality disorder. Now that we've read, identified and named the apparent disorder in each character, to my mind, this tells us very little about what's going on in the novel, what's happening psychologically for these individuals, or what creates these behaviours. The key lesson from both of these texts that I hope people will be able to take away um, is that naming a disorder, and this is something that comes up time and time again in fiction, tells us very little about what's happening for an individual character. And I think this is an important lesson that can be taken from clinicians as well. Kaysen does something particularly interesting with the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder in, in her autobiography. She obtains her clinical records and throughout the book, um, her narrative is interspersed with photocopied pages of her notes. She takes the then current edition of the Diagnostical and Statistical Manual Criteria and refutes this conceptualisation through examining each of her symptoms in turn. She states, It's a fairly accurate picture of me at 18, minus a few quirks like reckless driving and eating binges. It's accurate, but it isn't profound. Of course, it doesn't aim to be profound. It's not even a case study. It's a set of guidelines, a generalisation. Kaysen presents the beginnings of a critique of the meaning of borderline personality disorder, for her at the very least. She states, it appears to be a way station between neurosis and psychosis, a fractured but not dissembled psyche. Though to quote my post-Melvin psychiatrist, it's what they call people who lifestyle, whose lifestyles bother them. And again, that's something that still remains quite common. Kaysen's refutation of her diagnosis marries with this view. Many of her experiences could, throughout the novel, be ex accounted for by merely being 18. And she states at one point, when confronted with the diagnostic criteria in the psychiatrist Bible, isn't this a good description of adolescence? Moody, fickle, faddish, insecure, in, in short, impossible. Darian, on the other hand, is more ambivalent about needing a name for her experiences. She adopts a variety of labels throughout the novel, none of which are actually confirmed by her psychiatrist, interestingly. So at one point, she suggests she has Munchausen syndrome, some other obscure personality disorder. And she concludes, again, quite flippantly in the way she says it, I read about a disorder and I have it. Bulimia is in vogue, I start puking. Donahue does a bit of nymphomania, I become a sex fiend. <laughs>
Self-mutilation is very popular these days. Somebody prints an article called The Cruelest Cuts and bam, baby, I'm there. Her flippancy actually hides a deep-seated fear that there may in fact be nothing wrong with her, as this suggests to her that her distress is neither true nor fixable. And I feel that this perhaps is testament to our current extraordinary culture of medicalisation. In the past, we may not have attributed distress to a form of mental illness, but what Darian suggests throughout the novel is that her distress is only authentic if it fits a diagnostic category. Dr Lindholm, her psychiatrist, appears to have an interesting perspective on the cause of Darian's behaviour, telling her after her lists of self-diagnoses, you're not going to persuade me by pinning your argument on personality, especially not on personality. I'm one of the original unbeliever unbelievers. I barely passed that course in college. Now, it's never really explained in the novel what she means by this in a, either a clinical sense or um, in a, a more realistic sense, if that makes any sort of sense. But rightly or wrongly, throughout the novel, Dr Lindholm's casting aside of the naming and diagnostics of a disorder allows a therapeutic space to explore the meaning and reasons behind Darian's actions. And ultimately, this leads to a successful outcome for Darian. So again, another conclusion that I seem to be explicating by proving my argument backwards is that naming the disorder does very little to help these individuals understand their emotions or actions, and let alone change them. In this respect, our two storytellers, Darian and Kaysen, prefigure a growing scepticism among some researchers and clinicians about the usefulness of the borderline personality disorder diagnosis for understanding self-harm. As Maggie Turp argues, self-harm occurs in people with a multitude of other diagnoses and, indeed, much as we hate to admit it, in a large proportion of people who actually don't have a mental illness. As an alternative to embedding deliberate self-harm as a sign of personality disorder, two other psychological models can illuminate these texts. Nancy Nyquist Potter, in 2003, creates a structuralist poetics of self-harm, in which she focuses, it's her words, not mine, in which she focuses on the communicative significance um, of self-harm by imagining the body as a form of text. She suggests that giving uptake, put simply listening to clients' own meanings for their actions and supporting them to reach their own interpretations, can facilitate clinician understanding of the difficult and complex behaviours engaged by people with, self, with borderline personality. She argues that to be a good healer, the clinician must have accurate knowledge. To gather correct knowledge, the clinician needs to listen to the patient in ways that allow the new knowledge to emerge. She continues that part of knowing how best to treat a particular self-injuring patient is coming to an understanding of what such behaviour means to that patient. And to do that requires an ethics of communication, a central feature of which is the virtue of giving uptake. It seems to me that in the whole paper, which I've summarised in two sentences, which doesn't really do justice to the paper, what's crucial is this notion of listening and learning to the patient's own narrative. And it seems to me that this has parallels between what we do when we read a novel. We listen and we learn from the character, the narrator, whoever it is who's speaking, we learn from their own knowledge. Literature, to me, is a central mode of communication, although I'm sure that less avid readers may argue differently. The second paradigm that I want to bring into play before I go back to talking about the books comes from Karen L. Soyamoto, who argues for a focus on the function of self-harm. According to Soyamoto, self-harm serves several functions simultaneously, and two of these pre-recognisable categorical models, um, effect regulation, dissociation and boundaries, uh, relate particularly well to these two novels. Listening to and seeing acts of self-harm within their context, their network of individual meanings, significations and functions may lead us to a deeper understanding of these seemingly incomprehensible acts. Darian, 
in case in uh, Dewar's Bird's novel talks about a number of acts of self-harm throughout her life. And again, she does this in quite a cold tone. There's very little emotion when she's discussing these uh, acts. She talks about breaking her own hand by slamming it into a locker door, um, the attempted self-amputation of a toe, burning him herself, uh, and a deliberate severe fracturing of her hand following the repeated punching of a wall. Now, what I think is interesting is the way she describes this as a mental game in which her opponent is herself. She states, this is my finest sporting event, and this relates to her punching of the wall. Mortal combat with a voice that hisses and sneers, pussy, chicken shit, baby bitch, what are you fucking afraid of? You can't do it, you can't do it. She then goes on to describe the emotional effects of the self-harm as leading to a soothing blank, green and cool as a kindergarten chalkboard. The pain is amazingly peaceful. So again, we've got this paradox between the violence and the activity of the act and the peacefulness that she gains emotionally from this. She states that when she's self-harming, her screaming is externalised. And here we can see several meanings and effects of her self-harm. Communicatively, it's a visible and audible expression of hidden internal pain. Furthermore, the combative nature of her self-harm is later externalised through her love-hate relationship with Dr Lindholm, a meaningful insight which, if left unidentified, could potentially lead to this therapeutic nihilism described by Winston. Susanna Cason's wrist-banging and face-scratching is, in contrast, not comprised of this visible expression of emotional pain, although it is significant for her to have this expression. She switches from face-scratching when questions begin to be asked and turns instead to bruising her wrists, which is less visible. She states, Part of the point was that nobody knew about my suffering. If people knew and admired or abominated me, something important would be lost. She continues by elaborating that, her sit that the situation was, I was in pain and nobody knew it. Even I had trouble knowing it. So I told myself over and over, you are in pain. It was the only way I could get through to myself. I was demonstrating externally and irrefutably an inward condition. The case in physical pain is not soothing, but it's a counterpoint to the inexplicable, hidden but felt internal pain. And it's only when Kaysen learns through psychotherapy to identify, acknowledge and vocalise both to herself and to others her internal pain that she can begin to heal. And again, I think there's some parallels that can be drawn here about how novels unfold and similarly the relationship that patients may have with a psychotherapist where stories are unfolding slowly and it's about a process of gathering information before you reach the conclusion. Both Kaysen and Darian experience different levels of dissociation, which is a common feature of deliberate self-harm. Dissociation is literally a suspension, of, a, a suspension of conscious awareness, and thus a suspension of the feeling of emotional pain and frightening emotions. Within Soyamoto's dissociation model, the act of self-harm serves to regulate effect. For Darian, dissociation occurs when she comes close to realising the truth about her sister Dayton's death. And again, this is something that's hidden from the reader for a good half of the novel. Dayton's not mentioned at all. So much like the therapist, the reader remains in the dark about this huge big event that causes profound impact. During one particular psychotherapy session, Darian experiences dissociation and bites her thumb in order to return from this state. She has no recollection of doing so, and when asked by Dr Lindholm what's happened, she becomes irritated and can't answer, stating, I cast my mind back for a reason, for anything, but my brain is hollow. Everything is slippery and there are no edges. And again, this seems to me to be quite a good description of emotions which often don't have edges and boundaries that are slippery and can't always be pinned down to one particular feeling. 
Seeing this action within Soyamoto's model allows for the possibility that not all deliberate self-harm is, as despairing clinicians sometimes conclude, willfully committed in order to gain attention or manipulate a situation. Acknowledging this via the literature could in some way induce some level of sympathetic understanding as opposed to self-blame and patient blame that can occur. I am getting to a point where I'll be concluding. As far back as 1938, Carl Menninger expressed a long-running debate that continues to this day and is still as hotly debated about the difference between deliberate self-harm and suicide. He writes, or wrote rather, I'm sure he's long dead now, local self-destruction is a form of partial suicide to avert total suicide, in which the suicidal impulse may be concentrated upon a part as a substitute for a whole. This is reiterated by Kaysen, who states almost verbatim, it was only a part of myself I wanted to kill through her overdose of 50 aspirin. And ironically, she writes that she wants to kill off the part that wanted to kill herself. For Kaysen, the suicidal gesture becomes a form of localised suicide that is paradoxically a remedy for the suicidal impulse. And these paradoxes are, are replete in fiction. There are so many of these kind of paradoxes that really can make us aware of the paradoxes that patients may be experiencing themselves. Menninger's notion is complexified through Darian's relationship with her twin sister, Dayton, who it turns out committed suicide in her teenage years, causing a trauma so great for Darian that she repressed it completely from her consciousness and hence the reason it comes out in tiny, tiny pieces throughout the novel. Borrowing from Menninger and returning to Nancy Nyquist Potter, an example of a literal signification of localised destruction, self-destruction, can be seen. Darian's partial suicide through self-harm is a repetitive reenactment and subsequent evasion of her twin sister Dayton's actual suicide. The signification is further complexified when we consider Soimoto's boundaries model, in which she writes, Perceived abandonment creates intense emotions that threaten to engulf the self of the patient, and her lack of boundaries leads to experiencing the loss of other as a loss of self. This loss is combated by self-mutilating. So again, through literature, complicating this model further is the fact that Darian's threatened abandonment is actual. Dayton did kill herself, and it involves not just the loss of an other, but her twin self. It's fairly unsurprising, therefore, when we reach this conclusion in the novel, that Darian has self-harmed partly in order to counteract this acute threat of abandonment. The benefits and drawbacks of using literature to inform clinical practice are well documented. As neatly summarised by Alan Beveridge, critics of using literature to inform cl clinical practice argue that this mode of learning is not a substitute for real-world experience. Literature and reading is an isolative experience. It doesn't engender any sort of altruism towards others. It's not clinical and therefore is less valid a form of learning than medical and psychological literature. Diagnostic readings ignore the ascetic purpose of literature, and I would agree with that. And furthermore, many clinicians lack the time or inclination to read fiction. Conversely, those who are for using literature to inform clinical practice, of which I'm one of them, suggest that real-world experience is sometimes only available through a textual medium. Um, as a clinician, you don't meet every kind of patient with every kind of disorder. So it could be that to get an idea of how someone is suffering from a particular illness, the only way of doing that is through a case study, an autobiography, or a novel. Literature can provide a sense of being with a person's experience rather than objectifying individuals into a set of criteria. And thus, to my mind, it can aid in the development of empathic and ethical skills. And I hope that's something that I do quite successfully with my students. So they may disagree. I make them read books, and that sort of seems to be a bit of a challenge to most of them. 
So through analysis of these two texts, what can be learnt regarding borderline personality and self-harm? We can learn that with empathic and compassionate understanding of individuals who suffer from a huge amount of damage, individuals may be able to go on to lead healthy and successful lives. Both Kaysen and Darian have successful outcomes in their novels. <coughs> me. Literature, both in terms of direct presentation in autobiography and as a representation, literally the imaginative fictional mode of representing experience and emotions, stands as a testament to the difference between prevalent clinical attitudes and the experience of individuals who suffer with mental illnesses. Literature can serve to remind us of the distress behind acts that appear incomprehensible, as well as the need to untangle the complex meanings behind such acts. In this particular case, literature has, I hope, offered a critique of the usefulness of merely diagnosing individuals. It serves as a vehicle for learning to listen to individuals and to the highly individual meanings and functions of the outward symptomatology of their distress. The two texts here are written directly through the perspective of the patient. The clinician's or relative's thoughts are mediated through first-person narration of the individual suffering. And I believe this is something that Morris is going to talk about this afternoon when he discusses the representation of the psychiatrist in fiction. Through literature, clinicians can learn a valuable skill, which is, in Potter's words, giving uptake with a kind of practice patient without the risk of causing further damage to individuals already suffering. Fiction depathologizes and rehumanizes people who engage in deliberate self-harm by going beyond symptoms and behavior. In fact, symptoms and behaviors are ignored in the context of explanations for symptoms and behavior. The two narratives examined here are not the only examples of this in literature. Um, Rebecca Ray's A Certain Age and Jamie Gordon's Bogey Woman both explore deliberate self-harm in adolescence through the medium of fictional first-person narration, while Caroline Kettlewell's highly acclaimed Skin Game is an illuminating autobiographical account of self-harm, and they should all be on your reference list. Further research that I'd like to look at in this um, at some point, she says confidently, may explore the effectiveness of a bibliotherapeutic model. So the notion of using texts such as Caroline Kepperworth's um, Skin Game in order to encourage clients and individuals who self-harm to start thinking about their own reasons and reasons behind these incomprehensible acts. And just to conclude, I'm going to leave up some questions that we may like to consider as the day continues around musings that were raised for me in this paper. So what issues are raised when we begin to discuss authenticity around the portrayal of madness? What is an authentic portrayal of madness? How do we read a book like The Wonderful Hallucinating Foucault and define it as an authentic portrayal of madness as opposed to a truly awful book which was recommended to me called Lisa Bright and Dark, um, which talked about schizophrenia in terms of split personality. Um, how do we differentiate between these two kinds of portrayal? Is clinical accuracy important to a novel? And I suppose that leads to questions around the social functions of novels and the educational functions of novels. But indeed, what do we mean by clinical accuracy when diagnosis and presentation can be slippery concepts to put together? Are there demarcations between literature that examines clinical madness literature that explores psychology and mad literature. There is a body of work on mad literature, I promise. I'm writing a whole PhD arguing there is, so fingers crossed I'll prove it. <laughs> to what extent can and should literature be used to inform clinical practice? Does literature serve to emphasise the diverse nature of individual madnesses, perhaps in opposition to scientific classification? Should literature be read with the aim of diagnosing, explaining, and or interpreting characters and themes within one or more kind of clinical discourse? And certainly there's a huge body of work on literature and psychoanalysis, for example, that reads text through a psychoanalytical vein. And can parallels be drawn around the relationship between doctor-patient-carer, 
and author, character, reader. Feel free to adjust those orders as, as you think. And what does this imply for how we mediate, interpret, and hear or listen to various stories? If anyone's got some ideas on this, I'd like to hear them, because I'd quite like to write a paper on it, but it keeps getting a bit muddled in my head. So that's me finished.